Harrison won our contest this past week. And so come claim your gift there, brother. Congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't know what's in it, but uh, <laughs> if you would like to participate in next week's contest, I believe the uh, trivia, whatever, will be up uh, tonight into tomorrow morning, and uh, we'll announce the winner. We do use a randomizer, so there is no favorites. A computer actually picks the winner. On April 3rd, next Sunday, following the morning worship service, right through those doors down the hall uh, in room number eight on April 3rd, right after this service, if you've been coming to the church for the last six to nine months or earlier, uh, I wanted to let you know we're going to have a meet the pastor there, uh, an opportunity for you to get to know my wife and me. And uh, so just make your way through those doors. We'll have some snacks and we'd love to get to know you. And then on April 10th, for anyone that would like to know more about the church, the mission, how is it that I get informed, how, do I, how might I discover the processes to get involved, on April 10th at 4 p.m. in our student center, uh, we would encourage you to, to uh, make your way there. It is across the parking lot. And uh, we'll have a session called Discover GFN. It'll be one hour long. You won't be asked to commit to anything. It's just for an opportunity for individuals to get to know a little bit more about the church. So on April 3rd, after this service in room 8, uh, meet uh, my wife and me. And then April 10th at 4 p.m., Discover GFN in our student center. We hope to be able to see you there. Well, it's Resurrection Sunday, the day in which we celebrate not only the sinless life and the death of Jesus, but the resurrection of Jesus. The grave is empty today, and we rejoice that Jesus Christ has provided for the salvation of all humanity. As we begin this morning, I want to let you know from the very first moment where we are going to end. I want to give the Holy Spirit as much opportunity to speak to all of us as he can. And so I'm going to tell you where we're ending as we begin. The whole point of the parable of Age of Ultron is to introduce us into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our culture loves to self-identify with the title Christian. It's been a part of our American DNA since its inception. And I'm not going to question that of anybody. But I, I do wonder how many of those who identify, self-identify as a Christian have been transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning, have you been made a new creation in Jesus Christ? Not declared to be Christian by your membership, not declared to be a Christian because you were baptized as a child, but you yourself have had a dynamic encounter with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Christ himself came and washed you of your sins, transformed your heart, and today you proclaim, I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. You can leave today having been transformed by Jesus Christ. You, you can leave today knowing that Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. In order to help us get there, we're using the parable Age of Ultron. It's an Avenger movie. And as you know, there are a lot of characters in those movies. So today we're focusing in on two individuals, twins called Pietro and Wanda. We're going to explore the journey that they take in this movie and how it often mirrors our journey. And we're going to discover what Christ has done for us through his death and resurrection. Let's begin our parable today. Pietro and Wanda are straight up mad at the world. So mad that they let a German scientist do these crazy experiments on them that could have resulted in their death. It was their anger, it was their rage that kept them alive in the middle of the chaos of those experiments. Soon we're going to find out why, but for now let's just settle on the fact that these twins 
are so frustrated with the world, so frustrated with humanity, that they are looking for any way to express that rage. Today, all across America, men and women will gather in places like this. They, they want to identify with Christianity. They want to identify with the Christian life. And, and they may have been away for quite a while. But on this day, they're going to gather in places like this to see if, if anything has changed since the last time they were in a worship service. Some have tried the Christian faith. Some have tried Christianity. They, they found it largely lacking. They found it largely disappointing. They, they didn't see the, the change in people's lives that they hoped they would see. Maybe God had done something or allowed something in their life that caused them frustration. Maybe they had a loved one pass away and they were praying that God would, would help their loved one and and the loved one died anyway, and they got mad at God for it. They, they may have been a part of a church where people were self-serving and carnal, devoid of any attitude that reflects Christ. And, and today, all across America, some will gather in places like this who have never experienced Christianity, never been in a church before. Regardless of the reasons there are folks here today that have come to the, to the conclusion that God has let them down, that God hasn't been worth following, but you're here today as an act of God's grace, not by accident. God's grace has brought you to this place. You do not have to live life mad at God. And the world. You've come to this place with the unspoken inner hope that there is more to Christianity, more to God, more to relationship with Christ than you have previously seen or been led to believe. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. When the pastor said there is more to a relationship with Christ than a label, that he can make us new creations, that there can be a fundamental foundational change in the core of who I am in relationship with God, if that is possible, could it happen in my life? There's a reason you're here today, and today can be a day that changes your life. Back in the beginning of time, God created Adam and Eve. He had given to them everything, everything that you could imagine, except one restriction. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else is yours, but don't eat from that tree. Satan convinced them that if they ate of that tree, then they would be like God, that God would then have competition. And the reason why God restricts us from certain things is because he doesn't want us to have a good time. He doesn't want us to, to be happy. He doesn't want us to be like him. And so why don't you go ahead and, and do what it is that God doesn't want you to do? We know that they did that very thing, took life into their own hands, and all of creation fell apart. Satan, like Ultron, has convinced us that we have a right to be happy. We have a right to be angry. We have a right to, to be frustrated with God. We have a right to do things our own way. We, we have a right to, to ignore the biblical parameters. The church is full of hypocrites. No one does what God's telling people to do. That's what Satan would have us to believe. But the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The reason Jesus had to come and die on a cross, the reason Jesus had to suffer like he did was because of your sins and my sins. That's the reason. 
God wanted to provide a way to make right the relationship that humanity has with him. He wanted to break down the power of sin over humanity. He wanted to destroy the power of sin over humanity. He wanted to make a mockery of that sin. But in order for that to happen, he had to give his life. God had to take on human flesh and die the death we deserve to live, to die. Some would say, Pastor, I'm not that bad of a person. Brother, sister, I didn't say you were, but I did say we've all sinned. And the scripture is very clear that sin separates us from God, alienates us from God. The holiness of God and the depths of sin cannot inhabit the same place. We need the cleansing work of Jesus Christ, his blood shed on the cross to wash us white as snow. His holiness finds sin repulsive, but the blood of Jesus washes us and God would then look at us as though we have never sinned. So we need to come to terms with which side we're on. We don't get to define the parameters. We don't get to decide the rules. God has already established those. And we need to come face to face with them. Has God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, made us a new creation? Or are we living with a spiritual illusion because we self-identify with a title? The self-identification of a title is very different than a deep, profound, transformative relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to know this morning, you can have more than a title when you leave here today. Jesus Christ can change your life, make you into a new creation today. As Wanda said, sooner or later, every man shows himself for what he is. God already knows who you are and what you need. Pietro and Wanda just realized they're on the wrong side. They discovered that the one they are following has one intent, the destruction of humanity. They've, they've come to realize that, yes, the good guys are flawed, but evil always seeks to destroy. See, your spiritual enemy is evil. He will always be evil. He has some desires for you. He wants to steal from you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to take everything that God has in mind for you, tear it all to shreds, and then make you believe that God is to blame for it. The enemy of our soul is prowling around looking for people to devour telling you you're just in your anger, telling you you're just in seeing all the hypocrisy, that, that as long as I just focus on me and make myself happy, that life will somehow make sense. As long as we're convinced that these religious nut jobs that stand in front of us on Easter Sunday aren't all they're cracked up to be, and the God he or she serves is not all he's cracked up to be, then I don't have to deal with a resurrected Christ. I don't have to deal with his message. I don't have to deal with who he is. There are two choices, God or Satan, heaven or hell. Our default allegiance is not God. I don't get to make those rules. They're non-negotiable realities. And Pietro and Wanda just discovered that they have been lied to. But God can make us a new creation. He can do that in your life. He can take that which is hurting and broken and transform it into something gloriously new. He can look at you as though you've never done anything wrong in your entire life. You can walk out of this sanctuary today with the belief that however old you are, God doesn't see anything bad that you've ever done. This is the truth of Scripture, folks. You can walk out of here transformed today. What is happening now 
in our sanctuary is that the Holy Spirit is talking to some. Have I been transformed by the presence of Jesus? Or have I relied on a title? Have I become a new creation in Christ? Or have I relied on the declarations of the church and what they say about me? Have I encountered the living Jesus? Or am I settling for less than what God has in mind for my life? Could it be that a relationship with Jesus could be so transformative as to make me a new creation? Could I leave today in the peace and joy of knowing that God has transformed my life? Did God actually create a way through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for me to be a new creation? That he would forgive me, embrace me, that Jesus would transform my life? This quick scene is a snapshot. In case you didn't know, Wanda has, uh, has had a huge part to play in giving Ultron the power he has to, to send Sokovia into the air and, and prepare it to come crashing to the earth. In a few moments, the city is going to come crashing down to the planet, like you saw in that image, and the whole planet is going to, to die. Life as we know it will end. She's come to terms with the reality that she had a huge part to play in that. She did this mind manipulation and turned the Avengers on themselves, sent them all running, and it gave Ultron, the bad guy in this movie, the opportunity to wreak havoc on the planet and prepare for this impending doom. Hawkeye, in his conversation with Wanda, tells her something pretty profound. He extends forgiveness to Wanda. He, he extends forgiveness to Wanda, letting her know that, look, the past is gone. It's over. You can't change that. What you can change is what you do from now on. It's a powerful moment because Hawkeye has been subjected in a previous Avenger movie to the same kind of manipul man mental manipulation that she has unleashed on the rest of the Avengers. He has been the recipient of her evil, and he forgives her anyway. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could find that kind of forgiveness? A way for God to forgive us of all of our sins, that it would be impossible for God to remember any of the stuff I've done. Living with the reality for all the sins I've committed, for all the mistakes that I've made, that I could have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That when the Bible says I can be a new creation, the old gone, the new come, that, that it could really happen in my life. That God would transform my life is a remarkable, remarkable thing. <laughs> this quick scene is a snapshot into the transformation that's taken place in Pietro's and Wanda's life. They were helping Ultron get ready to destroy Earth and now they are trying to destroy Ultron's army of robots from destroying humanity. I remember the first time I saw this movie, there was a sense of joy and pride. Hey, they, they turned the corner. They, they once were fighting for the bad guys. Now look, they're fighting for the good guys. It was, I, I, it was awesome. I remember cheering for them. It was an exciting moment for uh, a Marvel hero junkie. I'm prob I don't know if I'm as big of a junkie as Christina, but... Um, it was cool to be able to, to see that. There's one big problem. The kind of turnaround that takes place in their life usually takes place just in the movie. We cannot transform ourselves. 
we need a hero. Thousands of years of human history have demonstrated this in millions and billions of people. We cannot transform ourselves. No one can have a radical change in the moral nature of their heart outside or by, by, by doing some activity. I mean, we can't keep our New Year's resolutions for a month. <laughs> How in the world are we going to have the kind of radical moral transformation if we don't have a hero? We're not. We need someone outside of ourselves to act on our behalf. That is why Jesus came to earth. Generation after generation after generation after generation, spiritual failing, spiritual failing, spiritual failing. God said, I am sick and tired of the enemy stealing, destroying, robbing, killing. I am going to go down there and die the death that they deserve because of their sins so that I can set them free. We need a hero, and that kind of transformation can't come by our own strength. We need someone, a Savior, acting on our behalf that would come into our life and transform us in our inner being and make us that new creation. We need a Savior. God does something absolutely radical. He sent Jesus so we could see God in action. So Hawkeye, the guy with the bow, could not save himself, let alone the little boy. So someone else came and took the bullets that were meant for him so Hawkeye and the boy could live. My friends, Easter is all about Jesus coming to earth, living a sinless life, dying the death that we deserved and raising again so we would not have to live life in spiritual mediocrity, spiritual loneliness, spiritual frustration. He came and lived that sinless life, died the death that we deserved, and rose again on the third day so he could transform our life so that the power of sin and death and the grave would not have power over you. He came and lived that sinless life, died that death that we deserved to die, and rose again on the third day because in doing so, he earned the right to transform you, not just on the outside with superficial rules and regulations. He provided the way to transform you from the inside and make you a new creation. The Bible says in Romans 5 that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It says in that same chapter, quote, if death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes, sovereign life, in those who grasp with both hands this wild, extravagant life gift, this grand setting everything right that the one man Jesus Christ provides? Can you imagine the breathtaking recovery that your life can make today if you grab on to Jesus with both hands and say, I'm tired of living in spiritual mediocrity. I'm tired of submitting to cultural uh, uh, titles of Christianity. I want to be a new creation in Christ. And so what does Paul say in his letter to the second Corinthians? He says this, it is our firm decision to work from this focused center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life, a resurrection life, a far better life than people ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. 
We looked at the Messiah that way once and we got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. They're created new. The old is gone and a new life burgeons. Look at it. All this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and called us to settle our relationship with each other. God because of Jesus, living a sinless life, dying the death we deserve to die, raising again on the third day has provided something for you and me. If you're sick and tired of titles, if you're tired of being lied to by the enemy, if you're tired of him stealing from you taking from you, deceiving from you. If you're tired of living life without purpose and joy, if you want to be a new creation in Christ today, can be that day. In just a moment, we're going to explain how this service will end. But um, will you spend a few moments with me as, as we begin to sing a song together? If the Spirit is speaking, you know it. Let's listen to the Spirit. Some of you are seated in this sanctuary and you've heard what I've described. And you say, I, I want to be a new creation in Christ. I don't want a title. I don't want church attendance to be my defining spiritual attribute. I want Jesus. So I'm gonna, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I'm gonna ask those of you for whom the Spirit has been speaking to raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I want a new creation in Christ moment in my life today. So will you close your eyes for because I, I want you to know that I'm also going to, to ask you to respond. You can have new life in Christ in your seat. But after I ask you to raise your hand, and after I give moment for every, a moment for everyone to do so, we're going to stand and sing this song together. And if you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to come and pray these benches up front are where we gather to pray and there is something about stepping out publicly and saying I want new life in Christ that that there's something about making it public there's something about making that declaration public that opens the door for God to do something deeper in us so I'm going to ask you to do those two things you don't have to do either you don't have to do both but with no one but our pastoral staff looking around, would someone say, Pastor, I want that new life today. I see your hand. Anyone else? I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. You can put your hand down. Anyone else? Pastor, that's me. Pastor, it's me. You know who you are. God's speaking to you today. Will you stand with me, Father? This is the moment of Easter. All through the crucifixion narrative, there were critical moments. Jesus, as the songwriter said, could have called 10,000 angels and rescued him from the cross. In the garden, he could have gotten out. All along, Jesus could have said, I'm not doing this, but but he obeyed. So, Father, I pray that, that your spirit would grab us by the hand this morning. Walk us down to this place of prayer. We won't be embarrassed. No one will ask. 
or pry into our life. We won't think that person is bad, but we're going to celebrate with that person. We're going to celebrate your work in them. So Lord, will you help us to be honest with you? Our pulse is already quick. Your spirit has already spoken. Help us to be obedient to you today. Will you come? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for life in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, knowing that we could not save ourselves, stepped in the way, took the death that we deserved to die so that we would have a chance at life. Father, hear the desperate cry of our heart today as we repent of the sins of our past and cry out to you in desperation. Father, I want to be a new creation in Jesus Christ. I want the old to be gone. I want the new to come. I want to grab on to Jesus with both of my hands and experience this life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. Hear our prayer today, Father. And for those who are calling out to you today, may you help them to know that beyond a title, beyond a worship service, you transform their heart and life today. Make it so. Will you do me a favor? If you have asked the Lord to that prayer, if you have asked the Lord to come into your heart and make you a new creation, will you let us know so we can help you in your faith? And we can encourage you in your faith. We can help get you connected to folks that can help you grow in faith. Go to gfnchurch.org. Click the Connect tab. Tell us who you are and that you prayed this prayer today. Let us know how to get in touch with you. We will reach out to you and help you on your spiritual journey. And may the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who makes us new creations, Jesus, our hero, may he go with you today and equip you for every good work. May he fill you with a depth of understanding of the love that he has for you. And may you be transformed in Jesus' name. Amen.